We're dealing with 69 degrees Fahrenheit, 210,294 miles on the odometer. It is March 24, 2024. And welcome to the Cole Spivey channel, also kind of loosely known as the Please Subscribe Show. Yeah, watching some YouTube today, I uh, got into the making of 300. Actually, a pretty good little documentary about the making of 300. And we'll go over a lot of different things, especially what the, the guys had to go through, the Spartans. Now, they put were put into a training camp where they did gymnastics, metabolic, and lifting and throwing. It was like an intense training class where guys would either have to lose weight or they'd have to gain weight and muscle. And they ripped them all. Like, they got them all, like, bodybuilder style. Gerard Butler played the king in it and was working out in between takes and stuff. He'd be working out with weights. They filmed the whole thing in a studio. It was filmed indoors in a studio on a rock. They built this fake rock. It was this huge rock they called the rabbit. And they would train on that rock, and they would get the shots down. A guy named um, Zack Snyder. We got to start doing a Morrissey video known as Tomorrow from the album Your Arsenal, which was a 1992 album, I believe. Anyway, regardless, that's how I got to start. Works his way up to 300. Definitely, uh, Zack Snyder had a good, good career, still, still, still doing stuff. He was behind the Batman versus Superman Justice League stuff with Ben Affleck and um, the other people. Anyway. Yeah, 300 looks like a good one. It's it's some people consider it actually a masterpiece. It's based on the graphic novel by Frank Miller, who they used pretty much as graphic novel as storyboards throughout the filming. They they pretty much had it out on set, and we're trying to replicate a lot of that, staying true to the graphic novel. Later, he would do other comic book stuff like Batman and Superman, but. Yeah, I've been watching a lot of that. The acting's very intense. They want it to be very real. They de-stress the costumes. A lot of the costumes were made out of lightweight material, so it wasn't like real metal and stuff. But it, very, it looks very real, and it's an amazing movie. It's one I'm probably going to go out and end up purchasing. It's a, it's, it's, it's a very beautifully made movie, and it's, it's like it's, it's intense to watch. Anyway, I was watching a documentary on that. 300 looks like a good one. All right, heading off. Another day of delivery. Yeah, another statement about the making of 300 with Gerald Butler. Um, also, all the Spartans were put through a training camp where there actually were a gymnast training. So they were like in the same kind of gym where they had the rings and the bars. They could do pull-ups and all this stuff. And then they went to metabolic. And then they also went into uh, weightlifting and throwing. But they never did the same workout twice. So there's like a P90 kind of thing so the body would never be used to I meaning they put them through like warrior training so by the time they were ready to shoot they were like on edge you know and they did this in between takes and stuff like that sometimes usually you know, through a shoot they were either some of them that were you know close to the camera would, would have to work out between takes but also jerk butler would have to they actually would hand him weights and he would just start working out and they then they put the weights down and then he would you know they would say action and it was very very strange to, to watch the, some of the rehearsals and stuff for that but they have it all on youtube it's like a whole documentary also just to let you know butterflies are at the garden botanic gardens all the way till april 14th along with dinosaurs until may 30th so they're mixing the butterflies and the dinosaurs you know maybe maybe dinosaurs came from butterflies you know they Sometimes has, you know, birds, or actually birds came from, sometimes they feel birds um, are a distant cousin to the dinosaurs, distant relative, ancestral relative. They turned into birds, if you believe in evolution. I, I don't know about the butterfly thing, but anyway, they're doing both the butterfly and the dinosaur. Probably not. Um, maybe the pterodactyl, it's hard to say. But that's only if you believe in evolution, which that's just a theory. A lot of people do. Some people believe in the new earth theory. So it's like all the animals stay the same. I don't know. I'm up in the air about it. I don't think it really matters. But regardless, some believe in it, some don't. 
and then you know you, you could say there's a, could be evolution in th over three or six or seven thousand years if things evolve you could say also at Casa Manana they are getting ready to do Greece good year this year they did once they also did Mary Poppins now they're uh, going to do Greece well they're going to get ready to do Mary Poppins sorry the other one uh, Susie's Cool the Musical was the other one Got, I was getting mixed up with Mary Poppins Jr. But they're uh, having a pretty good year this year. All right, first delivery, 537-73.4. All right, I'll check out Sunday go-karts. See what's going on passing uh, the Trinity River on a bridge looking over or overlooking the uh, skyline of Fort Worth. Rockwood Mini Golf still out in on a Sunday. Probably wrapped right church, went out there, got some tickets to the go karts. Yeah, the story that goes along with that is my the story of my sister and I. She's a little bit older. She ended up becoming uh, a nurse. She tried to become a paralegal. She had to live out live out her car for a little while after she left her first husband. Anyway, she ended up becoming a. Uh, a nurse regardless we my dad had taken us to a go-kart place right off of uh denton highway maybe somewhere on the other side of watauga whatever that road is i think it's denton highway and uh kind of by summerfield and the entire time my sister would roll in front of me and slow down and turn around and laugh at me so i wasn't able to accelerate very fast she was teaching me self-control or something my dad did get on to her, though, because I did not get to have enjoyment, that much enjoyment in the uh, go-kart, circling the go-kart thing, the go-kart ring or whatever you call it. Benny, she kind of ruined my fun and thought it was funny to slow down and I couldn't pass without being run off the road. She'd also do this thing when I was younger when she'd really make me mad. She had this laugh that went like, <laughs> and, uh, she do this thing where she'd lean back and fall on her back and then you'd go after her like try to grab her hair or slap her and she'd kick you in the jaw with her feet she did it all the time i must have been kicked in the mouth several times eventually i'd have to learn self-defense finally my dad got his boxing gloves and we would go in the living room and we would box i'd box my sister and there's a rumor that i broke her nose but I, you know, I was just trying to put on a good fight. We, we were all, I, my dad showed me all three Rockies. Uh, Rocky one, Rocky two, and Rocky three. We watched them back to back. Not all the time, but it was just one time viewing of Rocky. Um, that was literally like, we had all three cassettes. We had a VCR in uh, like two different, three to four different rooms. Dad had a mansion. It had like one, two, three, See, so it had a main bedroom, or his main bedroom with jacuzzi and sauna, walk-in, all that kind of stuff. Huge room. Kept all his guns in the closet. Then you had a big living room with a fireplace. And then there was a kitchen. And then you pass the kitchen, there was a laundry room. And then you would go on the other side of the laundry room, and there's a huge living room that was once a garage, a two-car two garage, or I think it was like a four-car garage. And, uh... Yeah, it was probably a four-car garage. He had a model uh, car that was called a Singer. It was like an old antique car called a Singer they would keep in there. I raised ducks in that garage until it was turned into a living room. On the other side of that was a utility room. And then eventually there was an outside garage built where he kept hay, where he fed the cattle. Then we had a backyard pond that had a gazebo. And I don't know how many acres we had. We had quite a bit. It was, it was, a, it was too much to mow, let me put it that way without a riding lawnmower. 
Now upstairs, there was my main bedroom, which had bunk beds and a closet that was connected to a walk, kind of walk-in vanity uh, mirror, kind of part of the bathroom with two sinks. And then there was a bathroom with a toilet and then a slanted uh, part of where the roof was, where the shower was, which is kind of cool. It's a walk-in shower. Well, no, actually, no, it was a shower and tub. There was a walk-in shower, but uh, that was my sister's side. So my sister lived in the side with the turret. If you know what a turret is, the spiral things you see in castles. They have like a cone top. It's called a turret. She she lived in a turret, which was like, kind of like a little library kind of thing. She just kept stuffed animals in it. Then we had a, a closet, walk-in closet. My sister had a walk-in closet. And at the back of the closet was a shoe shelf. You could put shoes on it. But you could remove the shoe shelf and it would turn into a panic room. Um, then there was a bar. There was a bar between the two bedrooms. And then there was a living room and a balcony that overlooked the pond. Then on the other side of the bar was a game room that we kept a ping pong table. And that I later turned into my one of my bedrooms. It was a green room that was had a ping pong table. Um, then there was the main living room. And we had like Atari, ColecoVision was about as high as we got because we were raised in the 80s, 1980s. Carpeted floors. And then downstairs there was a library and a walk-in dining room or just the dining room basically that was in the front. And then a marble entrance, the marble floor had a grandfather clock. When you rang the doorbell, it went dun, 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 dun. The next to that was a small closet and uh, in the patio was a screen patio in the back that was underneath the balcony patio. Later he would add a pool that would be between the back door patio area. There was a huge pool, well, a pretty big pool with a little rock kind of thing, waterfall, things that kind of like that. Well, not, not too big, but average size pool. And then on the other side of that was the pond. The pond had the gazebo. And then the huge area in the back, the backyard. Our neighbors were the Coxes. I think they were rumored they were from California. And uh, then next to his mansion on the other side of Randall Mill was Eutectic Metals, also known as Lone Star Casting, which was a uh, refinery for gold, silver, and, and precious metals, and even diamonds. He had probably a few million, maybe more, of bullion of gold and a huge safe, a walk-in safe that sometimes we'd use as a tornado shelter if a tornado came in. The security guard was to close the door on us and we'd be in there with all the gold. <laughs> this is a true story. <laughs> the security guard's name, I don't remember his name, but he was bald and he knew Morse code. He taught my, sis, my sister Morse code. Um, he ended up dying later on. He's a pretty cool guy. He was an armed security guard that lived there next to him for many years until the, until the business caught fire. So as things that I had is I did have a CR60 motorbike. The really good one was like the CR70 or the CR80, I think, but it, there were Hondas. Also I had a Honda street bike that was very little. Probably got that in junior high or actually maybe even it was middle school. And uh, BB guns, had BB guns and high power rifles and uh, Colt 45, things like that, but I was not allowed to, to have those things, unless I was in the company of a parent. But we did go hunting, we'd go deer hunting at Christmas time. So I was taught how to hunt deer and kill an animal from about 100 yards out with a single shot. I was trained by my dad, who was special intelligence in the army during the Vietnam age era. He didn't have to go to the jungle, but he was drafted and, and, and was a teacher, taught radar in the army. And uh, even to this day, he still wears a Vietnam era hat. He has one with the uh, governor of Texas. Can't think of his name right now for some reason. Uh, let me see. If I can find this governor of Texas. Man, he's not the governor anymore. It's Greg Abbott now, but it was the other dude. Can't remember his name. But anyway, he's got a photo of, of him. Uh, Back, back in the day. Anyway. 
That was the Keller, the Keller days. We started off actually poor living in a trailer on my grandparents' property in Keller off of Randall Mill in a small but moderate sized house, like a three bedroom with a living room. Pretty, pretty, pretty nice sized house. We eventually moved from the trailer into that house. That house was turned into a workshop for his business, which was a gold and re refinery and precious metal business. And then he would build the mansion across the street from that, which is still there today. It's painted all white for some reason. It was brick. It was, it was designed to be brick and look kind of like a castle. Now, if you go into uh, South Lake, a lot of those mansions and stuff, they do kind of look like castles and stuff like Arabian castles and things. They've, they've got billionaires that live there. Like the CEO of Taco Bueno lived, lived next door to us for a while. They do these crazy uh, firework displays. I think it might be this one. Yeah, it's this one right here. So the 1980s, I guess um, we lived in that smaller house, first in the trailer. I think we lived in Hertz for a little while. Then we lived in the our grandparents' house off of Randall Mill, and then he built the mansion across the street um, on Randall Mill, and that's where Eutectic Metals on Star Casting uh, was, you know, and Precious Metals, all that stuff was there. Um, so my dad was a, was a movie kind of enthusiast a little bit but we were allowed to to pretty much get any movie we wanted. I remember watching Pink Floyd, The Wall, when I was about 12. We had like a copy of that on VHS. And like Beverly Hills Cop, all the Arnold Schwarzenegger movies like Commando and all Predator, and that came a little bit later. But Command, early ones like Commando and Conan the Barbarian and all that stuff, we were uh, allowed to watch a whole slew of movies old library i think they said that saddam hussein had a, actually a great collection of uh movies he had like almost every movie on vhs too but anyway we had a lot we could just access a movie and watch it you know i'll watch beverly hills cop over and over again when i get bored i had the soundtrack on a sony player you know one of the sony players with the headphones like bateman's character in american psycho and i'd go to the middle school and i'd be listening to that you know in between classes and listening to the soundtrack to Beverly Hills Cop. I learned to play Axel Foley on the piano at an early age. Actually, my dad told me how to do it on a little keyboard piano because my grandmother played piano and we had a piano too that was in the main living room area that the garage that was turned into, you know, the garage was turned into like a big living room. We had a huge grand piano in there and my dad would play these kind of funny songs on the piano that had these like weird lyrics. One was like, Kiss My a -double -S, you know, one song about washing his hands really clean and brushing your teeth and you can K-I-S-S, -S, my A-S-S, -S, or you can kiss my, you know. Uh, he, you know, he was kind of a, a stand-up comedian. I told him one time when I was in Chicago, I called him. I said, well, hey, I ran off to Chicago. I'm going to be a mime. And uh, he just said it was a cold, hard world. And then one time I called him and said, hey, Dad, I'm going I'm to be a stand-up comedian. And then his response was, well, you got to be funny. So, you know, he did, you know, as art goes in performance and acting, he was, you know, kind of a supporter a little bit, but he had like come to see my shows. I did Waiting for Godot. I played Lucky and Waiting for Godot. It was a very hard role, very hard, role. a lot of memorization, move around the stage and stuff, even though Lucky's supposed to be stationary, but to a certain degree, it's still a physical role. And uh, he basically just said it was boring. You know, all, most a lot of theater is boring, but you know, my mom though, on the other hand, is my biggest fan. My mom just loves everything. You know, big fan. But you know, it's just how I guess it's how life is a little bit. I think Sam Shepard had the same similar problem with his dad, but his dad is very very different. Sam Shepard's dad. Sam Shepard died of Lou Gehrig's not very long ago. He was one of our greatest playwrights, Pulitzer winning playwright. He had a weird relationship with his dad, and uh, I think his dad kind of made fun of him. And his dad was a World War II pilot in World War II, if I'm not mistaken. I think his name was Sam. His name was Samuel Rogers, 
his middle name was Shepard. He went by Sam Shepard. But his dad, I think, was like a soldier or something like that. And uh, became like just a miserable drunk to the point of death. And that's what he was writing about in the late Henry Moss, if you saw if you saw that. It opened, I think it opened with Sean Penn and Nick Nolte in San Francisco at the Magic Theater. Ethan Hawke would later reprise it on Broadway. But yeah, the late Henry Moss was uh, something that was, you know, like with us, we were all Baptists. So it was mostly like soda, you know. But my dad had some problems with the other stuff because uh, he was a polio survivor. So he had to take certain kinds of medicines and stuff, I guess. And it got him in a little bit of trouble. And Anyway, he ended up finally, during my second marriage in 2013 or so, a few years later, I'd say about four or five, maybe six years later, after I was married the second time and had my kids, I had three kids, eventually he sold the property for one million and then got out of debt with that and then took everything and moved into a smaller house on the outside of Keller and and then just kind of retired. And, uh, you know, he's got all the nice stuff and everything in the house. But um, how I see life, really, since I have lived in trailers and I've lived in mansions, as long as you have good central air, includes good cooling and good heating, and relatively a modest sized refrigerator, you can go without a washer and dryer as long as you have access to a laundry mat or if you just wash them with your hands, you know, clothing. You're pretty much living almost about the same, relatively about the same as any, any rich person when it comes to being rich or poor. Now, if you don't have any of that, then it can get tough. And there are people that do live like log cabin days kind of stuff. Uh, one of the richest guys that I've ever met, you know, in person and had a conversation. Well, I've met a lot of them, but I'm talking about having like a, a pretty lengthy conversation was um, Bert Chavitz, the owner of Bert Bees. He was almost pretty much a billionaire. Only He only took home 20 million, but Roxy took home like 600 million. And I think Johnson Johnson cashed it all out for about a billion. And that's Bert Bees. You can find him in any gas station, whatever. Well, I met that guy and talked to him before he passed away. Isabel Rosalini was executive producer of Bert's Buzz at the time when I talked to him. I was writing a book in Dover, Dover Foxcroft, Maine. About Maine. It was mostly about Maine. It's called Escape from Me. And uh, I, I, got an, I got an interview with Chavez on accident. I was at a Shaw's and someone had called him Bert. It, was, it looked like a well-dressed homeless guy with a long beard. He never had running water. He never had electricity. He never wanted it. He lived in a cabin. He had his uh, stove. It was like one of those... I forgot the name, but what do they call it? The potbelly stoves. And that's what he used for heating. Other than that, he just lived off nature. He was, he was a Life magazine journalist that turned into a beekeeper. And ended up opening kiosk in Asia for Burt Bees. Burt Bees is an international phenomenon. I used to have to pick up my son from school, and uh, he had a pretty cool teacher. She was a, 
a little older, maybe a little, a little slow, but not too slow, but she was definitely different. He ended up biting her though over something. I don't know what happened. He had a biting problem. He'd bite people. Um, this was like kindergarten, you know, one time and I was doing an Uber after I left the bank. Uh, I had got this Uber and I was like, oh, I'll go ahead and get it. And it was like maybe an hour till I had to pick him up. They were going like, we lived in Irving. So we were like in Irving. They were going like the other side of Dallas. So it was like in the ride or went ahead and took the dude and then sped back. And I think the pickup time was like three o'clock or something. And it was like, by the time I got, you know, him dropped off, I only had like 15 minutes to go from north side of Dallas or something all the way back to Irving. So I'd call the school and they said, well, when that happens, if you're gonna be tardy to pick them up, we just take them to the principal's office and everything. So I came in about, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 minutes. I don't remember exactly how late I was, maybe 30 minutes late. I don't remember exactly the time. He was in the principal's office, just kind of sitting there. He had a big smile on his face though. So, you know, I remember I had to do that a couple times when I was younger, my mom would be late picking me up. It's, it's kind of a thing that, you know, kind of left on your own for a little bit, kind of think about what's going on. But kindergarten, I don't know if they really recall those kinds of things in kindergarten. I barely remember all kindergarten. I do remember when I was in kindergarten, I had a teacher called Miss Griffith and we had these uh, work tables, you know, different work tables that you could go to. One of them was like the glue station. Then you could go to the construction paper cut. We cut the construction paper with the scissors. And uh, so I, I wasn't exactly listening, I guess, you know, right. And she grabbed me by the ear because I went to the glue station too early and pulled me over to this construction paper paper, uh, the construction paper table. And then the rumor was my friend Verlo, who was this Native American guy I hung out with, because I was also Native American. Well, a quarter Apache, or maybe a little less than that, one eighth Apache. My mom was quarter Apache, but my grandfather, Papa Joe, was half Apache. Anyway, regardless, Verlo was more Native American than I. You could see it in his skin and everything. He was at the top of the this rock staircase behind Florence Elementary. Uh, pretty much in Keller, Texas. And the rumor was she kicked him and he went rolling down. <laughs> she ended up having to take some time off. She got pregnant, I think. Yeah, she kicked Verlo down the stairs. Seventeen three one point five.